This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. The goal here uh, is not to shut down the government. But just talking about it is starting to make some investors nervous as the deadline to get a budget deal done fast approaches. Rise of the renter, a fundamental shift in the way people pay for their homes, is creating a new frontier for investors and builders. Heating up, why an industry known for being boring is suddenly getting hot. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, September 10th. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. One short week from today, the world will watch Washington and the meeting of the Federal Reserve. But today, our nation's capital grabbed the attention of Wall Street for very different reasons. First, rumblings over a possible government shutdown October 1st are increasing, which House Press Secretary Joss Ernest addressed directly. If Republican leaders maintain their insistence on trying to pass a budget along party lines, then we are going to be headed for a shutdown. Because it's clear to anybody who's been paying attention over the last several months that they don't have the votes to pass a budget, uh, and that will result in a government shutdown. Second, the Department of Justice is cracking down on Wall Street executives, issuing new policies that target individuals, not just companies. And we're not going to let companies plead ignorance either. If they don't know who is responsible, they'll need to find out. If they want any cooperation credit, they'll need to investigate and to identify the responsible parties and then provide all non-privileged evidence implicating those individuals. And finally, the Wall Street Journal reports that the Department of Justice and the New York Department of Financial Services are investigating allegations of manipulation in the U.S. Treasury market, considered the most liquid and deepest market in the world. Eamon Javers has been following these developments for us. Eamon, what's the big budget fight about now, and what's the likelihood we see a shutdown? Yeah, Tyler, the, the Congress has until the end of the month now to figure this one out. They want to pass a continuing resolution or an overall budget, likely a continuing resolution to keep the government open by the end of the month. The big sticking point, though, is going to be funding for Planned Parenthood. Uh, Republicans in particular con uh, concerned about Planned Parenthood's support of abortion rights. Uh, that one is an issue that we know in American politics there's not a whole lot of give on either side on. The challenge for leaders in both parties now is is going to be to figure out a way to make this vote not about Planned Parenthood. And one thing that sources t on the Hill tell me today that's going to be key is whether the pro-life groups decide to score that vote on the budget as a vote on pro-life issues. If they don't, that'll give a lot of Republican lawmakers the leeway uh, to vote to continue the government. If not, uh, we could be in a situation where we're heading for a government shutdown again. To crime now, and if, is the Justice Department basically fundamentally changing the way it prosecutes white-collar crime? They're changing the way they begin their investigations. What uh, Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates said today in New York was that for too long, corporations have been allowed to simply write a check uh, and cop to some civil charges, uh, but not face for their individual executives any criminal charges that are going to throw anybody in jail. She said that's going to change, and part of the way they're going to change that over the Department of Justice is by beginning these investigations, going after individuals from the get-go, as opposed to going after a major settlement number. So often they're going after the big check and not going after the executives. This way, they say, if the companies want to get any credit for cooperating at all, they're going to have to turn over the actual names of the actual human beings who committed the fraud inside these companies. Let's go turn now to that uh, reported investigation into the Treasury uh, market. How concerned should investors be? Well, look, the Treasury market is absolutely vital, both to global finance and to the United States' ability to fund itself. Remember, we run at a huge deficit. The way we finance that deficit in this country is by selling Treasuries. So there's a lot to be concerned about in this market. I think this one has the potential, at least, to be as big as that LIBOR scandal that we saw. Hmm. The question is going to be whether or not there is actual manipulation that the government can prove here. If there are those smoking gun text messages and the like, then it could be a big one to watch. All right, Eamon, thank you very much. You bet. On Wall Street, a pause from the volatility. Investors had a chance to breathe and digest comments from David Tepper, an influential hedge fund manager, who said he was concerned about earnings and was not overly bullish on stocks next year. 
By the close of trading, the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 76 points to 16,330. The Nasdaq climbed 39. The S&P 500 gained 10. And overseas, investors paid attention to China and comments from the premier who said his country's economy is in good hands. Jeff Cutmore reports from the World Economic Forum in Dalian, China. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang used the opportunity of the keynote address here at the World Economic Forum in Dalian to address two key international investor concerns. One, the direction of the Chinese currency, and two, the state of growth. We've had a continuing slew of weaker economic data. The Premier wanted to reassure investors that China will hit somewhere close to the 7% GDP target growth rate this year. He said there will be no hard landing for this economy. On the currency, he also said there will be stability and no policy of trying to devalue the Chinese renminbi to get competitive advantage. Both of these messages should go down quite well with international investors and they'll probably be positively received by the US administration just weeks before President Xi Jinping is expected to arrive on a state visit. This is Jeff Cutmore at the World Economic Forum in Dalian for Nightly Business Report. And a multi-billion dollar deal in the logistics industry to talk about. It's not an area that we do talk about every day, but it is one that keeps the economy moving since it gets products from point A to the place where consumers like you and I can buy them. As we were first reported last night, XPO was acquiring the trucking company Conway for $3 billion. And that sent shares of Conway soaring, as you see there. And those of XPO, well, they went the other way, down 11 percent. Morgan Brennan explains why this once boring sector has suddenly got investors' attention. The acquisition of Conway draws attention to the massive transformation taking place at freight transportation provider XPO Logistics. Well, for XPO, this takes them from being a global logistics truck brokerage freight player to being really a leader in the North America uh, theater, uh, being able to offer full service any and all kinds of trucking services you might need. Conway is the latest in a long line of acquisitions for XPO. Since 2011, the company has made more than a dozen deals, including the $3.5 billion purchase of French trucker Norbert d'Entresangle in June. It's all resulted in gangbusters growth. From a company with less than $200 million in revenue in 2011 to one that will tout $15 billion annually once this merger is complete. But it's not just XPO either. UPS recently acquired Coyote Logistics, and FedEx's bid for Dutch company TNT Express is awaiting regulatory approval. Price Waterhouse Cooper says M&A activity in logistics totaled $14.5 billion in the first half of 2015 already more than the $12 billion for all of 2014. Experts expect the deal making to continue. As the economy picks up, fuel prices remain low and financing stays cheap. Well, we've seen this trend uh, where companies are not only expanding their presence in any particular sector that they, they compete in, but they're expanding the fleet of services they can, they can offer. Uh, so that when they go to customers, they can say, whatever it is you need, uh, hum us a few bars and we can sing you a tune. Uh, whatever it is you need picked up from point A to point B delivered via whatever mode, we have a way of accomplishing that for you. Satish Jindal, president of SJ Consulting Group, a transportation consulting firm, agrees. He expects to see more acquisitions as companies expand their services to cater to shippers in search of more efficiency. For that reason, he thinks future potential takeover targets could include Hub Group and Universal Truckload Services, two stocks that also popped on today's m and News. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. And now to another pillar of the economy, housing. Average long-term U.S. mortgage rates inched up this week. Freddie Mac says the rate on a 30-year fixed rate is now 3.9%. Mortgage rates are watched closely by people who are looking to buy or refinance a house, but a growing number could care less. That's because a big change is taking place, one where many don't dream of buying a home, but instead want to rent. And it's creating a new frontier for investors in single-family rentals and a new revenue stream for builders. Diana Olick explains. 
At a brand new community just outside Atlanta. You have no reason to sell any of your homes. No, I actually think that we're coming into perhaps the most compelling three or four years that, that I've seen since I've been in the business. Doug Bryan is shopping for more homes to buy for his company, a single family rental REIT, new homes to turn into rentals. We're starting to talk to more and more builders and starting to get more and more interest in not just selling us a couple of homes into development, but talking to bigger builders who want to set up a buying program with us. Starwood Waypoint, along with other large scale investors, bought thousands of foreclosed homes during the housing crisis and turned them into lucrative rentals. The expectation was they would sell once home prices recovered, but now they say no. Rental demand is just too strong. I think the, the institutional capital is still looking at this very carefully because there is a, there is a belief, in, and I support that belief, that is a long-term hold and there's yield and there's appreciation to be had. There are just over 44 million rental homes in the U.S., 27 million apartments, and 15 and a half million single-family homes or condos. Single-family rentals jumped by over 2 million since the crash, thanks to investors. Not only is demand rising, but more renters are willing to pay a premium for new homes. If you look at the, the people who are renting the homes, and you look at their credit profile and their income profile, these are not like wildly different people than the people that are buying the homes. Miami-based home builder Lennar is experimenting with the idea, opening its first single-family rental community in Nevada this year and planning more. This new investor demand could be just what the big builders need to build volume and price. For investors, it's a long-term bet that the shift away from home ownership is here to stay. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in New York. And I guess that's the key question here to talk more about the shift from home buying to renting and what it means for the housing market is Susan Wachter. She's the professor of real estate and finance at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. Susan, good to see you again. Welcome back. Pleasure. Let's start, first of all, with that key question. Do you view this as a trend that is here to stay? It is a trend that's here to stay. Uh, this renter demand is strong and it's going to get stronger. We seem to think, well, there's a lot of hand-wringing often about the housing market, that we're now turning from a nation of homeowners to a nation of renters. Do you see it that way, or does that overstate the trend? That overstates it. However, let's note that 63.4% is a new low, an historic low in home ownership. It is down to 1967 levels. Uh, that's really quite a shift from 69% in 2004. Many, many millions, up to six, seven million uh, new renter households, depending on how you count, net no new homeowners. And now mm. renter households are looking for, on the high end, new constructed single family homes. You know, we've, we've heard a lot of reasons for why this uh, is going on, but if you had to pinpoint it, what do you think is the biggest contributor to people wanting to rent rather than taking the plunge and buying? Well, there's always, of course, a desire to rent when you're short term, but I think this is a bigger issue than that right now in terms of the surge in renting, and that is people are locked out of the homeownership market. It's difficult to have the pristine credit levels that you need, and with housing prices rising and wages not, down payments are hard to come by, and pristine credit levels are uh, requirements are really as high as they have been, although they're coming down to some degree. Mm -hmm. But pretty much it's difficult to get that down payment and the credit together, uh, especially if you're just coming on to a job. You're a newly formed household mm -hmm. with a new job. Getting that savings in place is hard. Very quickly, with this move toward more renters, what does it mean for the values of homes and for people like us baby boomers who are looking maybe at some point to sell and downsize. What's it going to mean to the prices? Quickly. It's, it's all good. It's all good because these houses are going to be rented. This is part of this phenomenon. The investors are transforming the single family homes and now newly constructed single family homes for the rental market. Susan, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Susan Wachter with the University Pleasure. of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. And still ahead, the most powerful women in business. Who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down, who topped fortunes <laughs> list this year.
General Electric may shed more assets, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. GE says it is considering selling its asset management arm. Published reports say the probable buyer will be an established but as yet unnamed asset manager. Now, this as GE looks to focus more on its industrial products. Shares of the blue chip rose slightly to 2468. 2468. 3M is also exploring a spinoff of its healthcare data and software business. This is the Dow component explores uh, its portfolio, expanding some businesses while shedding others. Shares off slightly. 140.78 was the close there. And Lululemon posted earnings and revenue that topped estimates. The athletic apparel retailer also saw same store sales rise, but the company did announce a full year earnings forecast that was slightly below estimates. Shares did tumble more than 16 percent to 53.54. Duke Energy agreed to pay nearly $1 million and do environmental work to settle a case over coal-fired plants. That move settles a 15-year-old case against the company for allegedly violating the federal Clean Air Act. Shares fell slightly to 67.74. And late earnings from restoration hardware, better than expected. But the high-end furniture retailer's outlook for the current quarter disappointed. Shares were off slightly. In initial after-hours trading before pumping during the regular session, the stock fell 1.5 percent to 91.06. Positive news for Puma Biotech. The breast cancer treatment was positively reviewed in a publication. Shares soared in initial after-hours trading. The stock was up 3 percent during the regular session to 96.69. The most powerful women in business, Fortune, out with its uh, eagerly awaited annual list. It includes 27 CEOs who together control a trillion dollars worth of stock market value. The top three include IBM's Ginny Rometty, Pepsi's Indra Nooyi, and in the number one spot this year, the CEO of General Motors, Mary Barra. Here with more on the list is a familiar face and good friend, Susie Garab, special correspondent at Fortune and an NBR contributor. So why did Mary Barra knock Ginny Rometty out of the top spot? Is it as simple as she had a better year than Rometty? She's just overall been doing terrific things. You remember when Mary Barra became CEO of uh, General Motors, mm -hmm. she was faced with this huge crisis, that massive recall of those ignition switches that you guys reported so much on. But she acted swiftly. Um, she responded very quickly, calmly, and with authority. And while there's still bumps at G uh, GM, you know, compared to IBM, which has had 13 straight quarters, of uh, revenue decline, yeah. it was better. You know, the whole theme of this list, uh, Tyler and Sue, is guts and grit. All of these women leaders are tough. Uh, you look at uh, DuPont, Mondelez, and um, Pepsi. These three women had to fight off against activist investor Nelson Peltz and survive. So they're tough. And so is Mary Barra. There were also some new names on the lots list. Lots of them. Uh, lots of them, which is so encouraging. And some of them were, were a lot younger than perhaps <laughs> traditionally that would make that list. Just, so tell us a little bit about that. There are 11 that. newbies uh, to say newbies. that. I'm just going to talk about two of them. Ruth Porat is getting a lot of attention because she was a surprise hire at Google. Here's a woman who worked at Morgan Stanley her whole career. 30 years, she's the new CFO at Google. So no, she's not in the you know CEO or anything. But uh, investors uh, really like having her. She's also going to be part of the new Alphabet holding company, the CFO of that. And when she did her first earnings call, Sue, um, the stock went up. Uh, so that Google's market value went up by $65 billion. Wow. So powerful woman. Uh, the other one on a completely different industry, Kathleen Kennedy, mm -hmm. who is the president of Lucas Films. She was a secretary to Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. Uh, now she's kind of running the show, and she's the producer of the latest chapter of the Star Wars saga. Which is supposed be to be a, a huge, blockbuster yeah. movie. Risers and fallers, Always. Angela Arantz at Apple. Why did she come up as much? And uh, the CEO of Avon went down That's a lot. Right. We know about Avon's well chronicled troubles, including right. word today that they may be the target of a private uh, equity buy. There have been so many uh, rumors about that. Sherry McCoy uh, down. She's number 49, down from 27. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, big issue. What's the business model of Avon, you know, Avon ladies calling? Um, over at Apple, Angela has, uh, you know, the retail savvy. She's been there less than a year. Uh, she's supposed to be... Uh, creating new roles for those very successful Apple stores. We'll see. And she was behind the launch for Apple Watch. So. Susie, it's great to see you. And Taylor Swift made the list, too. Uh, Taylor Davis, Swift at number 51. 51. They've never had a 51. Good for but her. she's becoming a powerful she's very force powerful. in business, and yes. she's only 25. Which is fantastic. No, my no my bad girls blood will be so happy no to hear that. No bad blood. You, That's you right. know. Susie, great to see you, as always. Great to see both of you. Special correspondent for Fortune and our contributor. Coming up. 
a kickoff to a new season, my favorite season, where football's <laughs> biggest growth is coming from, and it's not on the field. Here is what to watch tomorrow. The producer price index is out. It's a tracker of inflation at the wholesale level and a read on consumer sentiment. Consumer sentiment is a key one there. Don't be surprised if it flags a little bit after that swoon in the market. The U.S. apparel market is the largest in the world, and now there's a new player, one with an established track record overseas that's setting up shop in Boston, and it wants to take on some of America's biggest retailers. As Courtney Reagan reports, it comes as the retail industry undergoes a period of rapid change. As if U.S. retail didn't have enough battles to fight, now it has to contend with the luck of the Irish. Today, Dublin, Ireland-based fast fashion retailer Primark opened its first U.S. store with a ribbon-cutting ceremony, creating nearly 600 new jobs here at the 77,000-square-foot, four-floor store in Boston's iconic Burnham Building, the former Filene's location. Primark began in 1969. Today, there are 292 stores in nine European countries, now one in the U.S. Primark is owned by the U.K.'s publicly traded Associated British Foods. The retailer's hallmark is its low prices, fashionable design, and decent quality for clothing, accessories, and home goods for less than the price of a pizza. $15 jeans, $14 sweaters, $3 towels. According to a Sanford Bernstein analysis, U.S. Primark prices on similar merchandise are 20% below Forever 21, 30% below Old Navy, and 40% below H&M. It's a new store, but from what I've seen, it's different and it's fresh and new and, and modern. I think the price point is really going to amaze people, and I think it's going to be an amazing shopping experience. Primark manufactures its own merchandise and says its technology, efficient distribution, and volume buying enable everyday low prices, setting up stiff competition for U.S. retailers. They'll certainly be very difficult for both the Gap division and the Old Navy division of Gap because they sell very similar product at even lower prices. They'll put a lot of pressure on the teen retailers, that's Aeropostale, American Eagle, Abercrombie & Fitch, because they'll get really a lot of following from young customers who really like to buy something at a bargain. They'll put pressure on the pennies, the coals, and people like that as well. SW Retail Advisors President Stacy Whitlitz says store locations are key. Whitlitz says that several of Primark's London locations have among the highest traffic and sales conversion of any retailer she tracks in Europe. But there are challenges. Most U.S. shoppers don't know what Primark is, and this is the first of just eight U.S. store openings by 2016. It will take hundreds to really take U.S. market share, and you can't buy online. Plus, other successful U.K. retailers have failed in the U.S., though many analysts think Primark will be different. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Courtney Reagan in Boston. And just a few miles outside Boston, where Courtney was, football season returns with Tom Brady and the New England Patriots taking on the Pittsburgh Steelers. And tonight's kickoff follows a tumultuous offseason. Eric Chemi in Fox Foxborough, Massachusetts, has more on the big business of the NFL and where the game's biggest growth is coming from. Despite the off-field issues, the business behind the NFL is still strong. More than 200 million viewers tuned in last season. That's an average of 19 million per game. With so much decline across television, NFL ratings are bucking the trend, continuing to climb, up 25% over the past decade, according to Nielsen. This audience is what networks are paying billions for. League revenues are $10 billion per year. Big TV deals mean even bigger team valuations. The 32 NFL teams have an estimated value of $46 billion, according to Forbes. That's a 23% jump in one year. The National Football League will continue to thrive. And the sheer volume and economics 
prove that it is a it is a juggernaut. The Patriots and quarterback Tom Brady faced much negative attention this offseason, yet even their merchandise sales have seen huge spikes. Brady gear is selling at nearly triple the rate since his suspension was lifted, while the team numbers are up 63%. Ticket prices also continue to climb up another 3% this year, according to Tick IQ. That's big relative to an economy seeing very little growth. But the biggest growth is coming from daily fantasy games. Companies like DraftKings and FanDuel are spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to get new customers. In fact, DraftKings is currently the number one spender on TV advertising in the country, more than household names AT&T, Ford, Geico, and Warner Brothers. This business of fantasy will be mentioned in the same breath and at least from an advertising perspective in the same way that the beer and the automotive and the fast food quick service, those genres are now being mentioned. If the NFL can manage its way through its off-field issues, there are a lot of fans out there and money to be had. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eric Chemi in Foxborough, Massachusetts. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Who do you like, the, the pack? I, I'm a Packers I fan. I know you're a... I'm a cheesehead from way back. All righty. That does it for us. Have a great evening, everybody. And for me as well, have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night.